What are you going to do with a book that has the witness of the Holy Spirit upon it, is indeed God's Word, but you don't know who the author is? That's the problem we have, one of the problems we have with the book of Hebrews. I know that some of our translations say that the Apostle Paul wrote it, but one of the early church fathers, Origen, said only God knows who wrote it. We really don't know who wrote it. And we know that Rome, keeping at a distance up until the fourth century, the book, recognizing and appreciating it, but refusing uh, to let it be canonical, uh, tells us that indeed, or that is, it gives us reason to believe that Paul didn't write it. There's not much argument that nevertheless it is Pauline. That is, the revelation involved in the book of Hebrews had to be from someone, either Paul or someone like him, or perhaps a student of his, because there is such revelation in it. Uh, in fact, there's no other New Testament book like it. There's not anything like it. Paul doesn't tell us uh, in detail or any other writer uh, about the priestly ministry of Christ there's only a few references to it until you get to the book of Hebrews. When you get to the book of Hebrews, you find out something you've never known before. It's a great book, but we're not sure who has written it or who wrote it. And, and uh, that's why you hear us say often, you hear ministers say, the writer to the Hebrews said. It's because we know that anybody that knows the history of the writer of the Hebrews isn't for sure that, uh, does not know for sure that Paul wrote it. It got under Paul's name because they included it in his collection. The, one of the canonical uh, criteria was, or criterion was that it should be written, that the letter should be written by an apostle. Well, they all were. All the letters were written by apostles until we get to Hebrews and we don't know who wrote it. But the way that it got into the New Testament as being the Word of God was that it had the witness of the Holy Spirit. Whenever it was read in public assembly, the Holy Spirit would operate. So they say, this is the Word of God. And finally, it made it in. You might be interested to know that even as far up into history as the time of Luther, there was some dispute about it. But if there's not in dispute any longer. We finally accepted that it is indeed the Word of God. That is a dispute about whether it should be in the canon or not. You can't tell it, and I'm not scholar enough to, to, to be able to tell it. I'm only a Greek student. But I'm told that it's the most beautifully written in all of the New Testament. The Greek involved here is so great that the man who wrote it must have been an orator. And um, uh, that's exciting to me to know that. And though I am uh, not able to read it, I can read the Greek, but I'd have to be more than a Greek student to be able to tell that it was an orator who wrote this. And you can see the oratory even in the English Listen how beautiful this is. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Now that is, beauti that is written beautifully. <laughs> and I have, you and I both have appreciations. You know something can be said so rough? So you almost miss its meaning. But as we discover, as we read the book of Hebrews, and as we, as we get into it, I think its exalted state, its beauty, what it has to say to us, we perhaps can recognize the value of the beautiful writing that it is in. Uh, God 
this song you sang a while ago. What was it? The, how lovely is thy dwelling place? You, you know that it wouldn't be right to put those words to a tune like Three Blind Mice. You couldn't do it anyway. But I'm just saying, what if you, what if you heard How Lovely Is Thy Dwelling Place by, you know, da, 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 da. Well, it wouldn't fit at all. So the Lord inspired this writer, maybe Paul. There, there is some thought that Paul may have written it, first of all, in Hebrew, and that Luke himself uh, did the uh, translating. He translated from Hebrew to Greek. That's a possibility. Oh, there's a lot of speculation. Um, one of the great church fathers believes that uh, Apollos wrote it. Apollos was, a, was an orator, remember? He was a man good with speech. They thought, they think he may have written it. Well, there may be some evidence. But I think one of the most interesting theories that uh, we'll only know when we get to heaven who actually wrote it, but one of the most interesting theories is the one that Priscilla wrote it, a student of Paul and a woman. And because she was a woman, her name was never attached to the writing itself. Barnabas is a possibility. But I think that Priscilla is one of the most interesting, don't you? That she actually may have penned the revelation that God gave to Paul. Well, again, we don't know. But whoever wrote it wrote one of the most beautiful pieces that's ever been written. It is not only the Word of God. It is art, a very fine piece of art. Perhaps the writer may have been like a legend told some years ago. It seemed that a circus acrobat uh, was converted. And he was Catholic. And he appreciated the Virgin Mary. And so in response and appreciation to her, he went in before her after his conversion and he was so overwhelmed in appreciation and in adoration, he didn't know what to do because he didn't know, any, he didn't know how to do anything but perform tricks. And so as the anointing came upon him, he began to flip cartwheels and everything that he knew how to do, he did it before the statue of the Virgin Mary. Remember, this is just a legend, but it illustrates a truth. And he was so happy and so blessed and so thrilled, he just did his finest. It was the finest circus performance that they had ever seen him do. And when he finished, he got to his knees and he bowed. And when he looked up, the statue came to life. And Mary came down and wiped the sweat from his brow. And of course, it was a, a wonderful, wonderful moment for that circus performer. Now, that's just a legend. But it tells us something about how a circus performer could respond. I do remember there was one that responded like that. Uncle Buddy Robinson, wasn't there? A man got saved in his ministry, and uh, when the glory hit him, he did cartwheels. And I can't believe I ever did cartwheels on this stage. But some years ago, I was telling about this story, and I did, I did se several myself. <laughs> I've never heard that story circulating. But uh, <laughs> it's a wonder, you know. I, I just did it. Don't know that probably will never turn a cartwheel on this stage again. But whatever the writer may have felt. Well, this this fellow that got saved, Uncle Buddy was preaching, and when, uh, when the glory would really hit Uncle Buddy, why, uh, the fellow would begin to do cartwheels, and it was all right for a while, but after a while, Uncle Buddy himself thought, well, I just wonder about this. Is this really the inspiration of the Lord, or what is happening? I wonder if he's just being excited in the flesh, and if I'm going to have to call him down. And But one day, while Uncle Buddy was preaching, the, the glory hit the place and the fellow began to do his cartwheels and he leaped so high he came down and landed on Uncle Buddy's back. And just as soon as he hit Uncle Buddy's back, the glory hit Uncle Buddy. Uncle Buddy preached all over that place to that man on his back. He knew then that it was the glory of God that hit that fellow who did cartwheels. Well, it was the glory of God that hit the writer to the Hebrews. So great that the most beautiful language that's expressed in the New Testament is expressed right here in this book. That's great, don't you think? 
I, I like to study the background and I want to make it interesting to you. I think that it's a wonderful thing that God would want you and I to go through the book of Hebrews for how long, I don't know, but in the next several weeks, we will be studying it. And I've given some time to it, several hours already. I want you to know that I'm preaching from the book of Hebrews under apostolic commission. I want you to know that that's, that makes it very exciting for me. I know that God did a miracle when I preached through the book of Romans. That was a miracle. God gave insights that are expressed uh, in the last chapter of, of the book that we just completed, that I just completed, Mission Without Strategy. The Lord really helped wonderfully. And there are, there are insights in, after preaching two and a half years, there are insights that I never obtained from a commentary. That stands to reason since it is the Word of God. But all the more so since God wanted me, commanded me uh, to preach it and to share it with you. Now we're under commission to share the book of Hebrews. Um, I want you to know that some people use this first chapter, to, uh, this first verse to try to tell us that God doesn't speak anymore having spoke in his son. Look at that first verse. God who at many times, sundry times, and in many different ways, divers manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. There's no argument at all. In fact, we need to appreciate that God spoke in many different ways and at many different times in, uh, under the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament. I'm thinking of the time he spoke to Abraham, get thee out into a far country. I'm thinking of those that he appeared to in dreams. I'm thinking of those that he appeared to in visions. I'm thinking of, of the different prophets that he spoke to and the different insights and revelations that he gave to them. He did it, and he did it many times. And, uh, but he, in the last days, he spoke by Jesus. This is, of course, the last days when the kingdom of God was inaugurated. And some have thought that, therefore, God doesn't speak to prophets anymore. I was puzzling over that thought, not having any commentary in hand at the time while I was flying or while we were flying from Fort Lauderdale to Charlotte and then on to Charleston. And suddenly... I, I felt that the Lord was speaking to me, helping me to understand how to come against that erroneous thought. For one thing, if God spoke, when he spoke through Jesus, if that's the last time he spoke, how did the book of Hebrews ever get written? The book of Hebrews written somewhere between two persecutions, the one in 64 and 65 and Nero and the other in 85. So in a, somewhere in a 20-year period and probably before the temple was destroyed because there's no mention of it. In fact, had the temple been destroyed, there's no doubt that the writer would have said it because the, the temple and the sacrificial system when it was destroyed would have verified the message completely of what he's saying because he's saying that we have a new covenant now. It's better than the old covenant and that the sacrificial system, the mosaic economy, is being done away with. Well, when the temple was destroyed, that certainly proved that, at least it would, to the Christian hearts, to people who were believe that Jesus was the Messiah, but that's never mentioned. So we, we, we think then it's written sometime between 64 and 70 before the destruction of, of the second temple. What was my thought before I went into that? No, just before that. Oh, thank you. Thank you, David, and thank you. I got excited about that part, and I forgot this other part. Well, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm flying, and I'm thinking about people reading this and, and about this thought that's abroad that God doesn't speak anymore. In the first, uh, and, uh, let me tell you that I'm preaching today because God spoke. I'm preaching today because he operated on what he wanted me to preach. So I'm so glad he is. But I wanted you to see that had he ceased speaking with Jesus, you couldn't even write the New Testament. You see what I mean? 
they could write down his words, and they did write down a lot of his words. And uh, maybe you would have to then say that his words proper would be the word of God and nothing else written. Well, that would exclude everything else. We exclude all of Paul's writings. But you see, Paul came after the original apostles. You see, and then this writer, if not Paul, whoever he was, maybe Paul, this writer was inspired by God. So while I was flying, I thought, oh my, this is indeed the word of God. It is not Jesus speaking. It is an interpretation of Jesus' life and ministry. And it's the word of God. So therefore, God had to speak to even get the book of Hebrews into the Bible. Isn't that wonderful? Now, there's another thing I thought of while I was flying. I thought of this. And what about authority? Why do we believe that Hebrews is the word of God? For two reasons, from authority, yet, and two means of authority. One, the church said so. The church determined that it was the word of God, so they placed it in the canon, and we have it now. But how did they know? They could only know, and the Westminster Confession tells you, said, how do we know that the Word of God, that the Bible is the Word of God? And then the, the people who wrote the Westminster Confession, the Presbyterian Creed, answer it this way. We know that it's the Word of God by the witness of the Holy Spirit. Well, don't you know what the witness of the Holy Spirit is? That's God speaking. We know that Hebrews is the Word of God because God speaks and says that it is. Now, he told the early church, the writer wrote it, God spoke. That was beyond Jesus. So he spoke again to get it written. Then he speaks again to get it into the canon. He tells the church, it's my word, get it into the canon. I want it to be a part of scripture. So he spoke twice there beyond Jesus. Now I was pretty happy about that. That may not mean much to some, but it means an awful lot to me. Because I have to deal with these thoughts and, and have to deal with them in a right way. Isn't it wonderful? Then, how do we know it's the Word of God? Well, by the same way that God speaks again. See, even while I've been speaking, the Holy Spirit's been operating. And so he verifies it's the Word of God. There's three different times that God speaks beyond when Jesus spoke. So he spoke through his Son. That brings us, then we have to reconsider the passage. He isn't saying that God quit speaking saying something quite different. He's saying that when he spoke through his son, he spoke in a full and final and a complete way as to what God is like and what salvation and how sa salvation is brought to pass. You see, he spoke through the prophets, but they only got glimpses of it. What did Isaiah get? He got a glimpse of his holiness. What did Hosea get? He got a glimpse of the forgiving heart of God when he married Gomer, you see, and did it as an example of God's love toward his people. Isaiah, looking up, got this great revelation of God's holiness, and of course he was purged, and he was sent forth to preach the message of God. Uh, others got different messages. David got a view of God. Abraham got a view of God. They got different views, and they're all expressed in the Old Testament. But let me tell you something. Jesus didn't have a partial view of God. He had, he had a complete view of God. The writer goes on to tell us about it, and, and here's what he says. Jesus, who from the... Uh, or let's read that second stanza, which goes from, or second verse, which comes in about Jesus. "...hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things." by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express or exact image of his person. You've heard perhaps Pastor Dave tell you that that word is character or it's the word used as a stamp. The image that's upon the stamp is stamped exactly out. It means that Jesus is exactly like God is. Well, by the nature of who he was. He was the son. He was God. He was the son of God. And therefore, as he came, he, he, he expressed what God was, was like. That's how we know what God is like. So who being the brightness of his glory and the expressed image of his person and upholding all things 
by the word of his power. See, it's a tremendous thing. He's saying that, that Jesus was the agent through which God created the world and that he holds this whole thing together. Now, you can't say that about any of the prophets. They're not like that. They're finite. But he's saying Jesus is God. He's saying Jesus is infinite. He's saying Jesus created the world. God created the world, that the agent was him, and that, it, and that through Jesus' word, everything's being held together now. So here we're coming to understand something more about what the Son of God is like. Well, we, we hear John say it, for he said that he was God and that he, he came from heaven and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory full of grace and truth. We, hear, we have other uh, explanations, but when we read, and in Colossians it is something like this that Paul wrote, but when we read this, we're finding that the writer to the Hebrews is wanting us to look at what Jesus is like. And he's wanting us to realize what, what an important person Jesus is and to get Jesus in proper uh, perspective. Now, they were having a problem in those days that maybe we're not having now, except that I wonder how exalted is our view of Jesus. Um, the problem was that um, the people who had become Christian out of Judaism were uh, under persecution. They were in the second generation, and they were on the verge of losing their first love. And um, they were being battered with theology. Remember, the New Testament was still being written. They were being battered through theology and they were being pointed, or they were saying that Jesus was no more than what the Old Testament prophets were. That's what they were saying. And the writer of the Hebrews, along with the other apostles, had a view to what Jesus was really like, had a revelation of God of what Jesus was really like. And so he's writing us here that he is the very glory of God. I think it's a wonderful thing to think about Jesus' glory. Rome, or the Roman army, was the glory of Rome. She was a conquering, harsh, subduing force. Jesus came as a suffering servant, and it says he was the glory of God. He was he, he, within him, and he was the very presence of God. I want you to look. It's a great con contrast there. We've got a lot of things to l learn as we look at Jesus. Two times the writer of the Hebrews says to us, consider him. Consider him. Remember in 12 where he says, uh, consider him. Well, let me find the first passage here. In the third chapter, wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. The book of Hebrews is wanting us to consider who Jesus really is. That's what we're going to be doing. In another place, I think in the 12th chapter of uh, Romans, uh, or of uh, Hebrews, yes, it says in the third verse there, for consider him, I like the second verse, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of God, the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him, that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. So you might say that one of the key things for us to do as we go through the book of Hebrews is to consider who Jesus really is. We may not have the problem they had, but I believe there's some, I believe there's some idols that are competing against Jesus in our day. Don't you think? I believe there are some things that keep us from an exalted view of Jesus. There's some things that God wants to do with us here in uh, the study of the book of Hebrews that would purify our faith and cause us to really understand and to know and, and to appreciate who Jesus really is. Now, the emphasis is not going to be on his manhood. It's going to be on his godhood going to be on his priestly ministry. And we, we, we appreciate the manhood of Christ and that he was fully man. But 
he was more than that. He was fully man, but he was fully God. So as we study the book of Hebrews, we're going to find uh, more about his godliness. And in these opening verses, we find exactly that. In reading this, as I read it again this morning and thought about bringing it to you, I, I thought it was something as we read these explanations of who Jesus was. There's seven of them here, but one of them just jumps out. Uh, for, uh, for its, the reason of its, its exception. Notice, who being the brightness of his glory, well, it starts early in that, whom he, he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, and that's what jumped out at me, after saying all of this, saying that, uh, that, that uh, he's going to inherit everything, he made all the worlds. He's the brightness of his glory. He, he's exactly like God in every way. He upholds all things by the word of his power. And then, before we get to the last thing, which is he sat down on the right hand of God, it says, and when he had himself purged our sin. I thought how wonderful it was because I believe that every sin, every one of my sins and every one of your sins uh, changes the universe somewhat, affects it somewhat. And every time we sin against God, there is an effect. There's a, there's a, a little more of his image marred. And yet when Jesus came, Of course, the Old Testament system taught us to appreciate how awful sin was because when you saw the throats of the heifers cut and of the sheep and you saw them die and you saw their blood drain, anything that would have to be done like that must mean something awful has happened and something awful had happened. And over and over and week after week and day after day, these, these animals were sacrificed because of the sin of man, because Adam and Eve disobeyed God and brought such an awful calamity upon us. But when Jesus came, that which was never accomplished in all of history was accomplished on Calvary. He purged our sins. He carried them away. He took them all away. Now that's done before you and I believe. The the possibility of it, the reality of it, the objectivity of it is done when his blood was shed. It was done right then. That's a tremendous thing. When I think of how our psychiatric places are filled and I think about how people are suffering, many are suffering over the fact of sin and they can't do anything about it. And the psychiatrists can't do anything about it. They might help a little, and they have their rightful place, but nobody can take away our sins but Jesus Christ. When I think about that, he's taken away my sins. And when I think that when I get to the judgment, they aren't going to be there by God's grace. They're not going to be facing me. It is so wonderful. I hardly know what to do. He who was so great, he who was so wonderful came to earth to take away my sins. He purged my sins. He carried them away. And then he did something. Went back to the right hand of majesty. Went right hand of God. There he sets in honor and in power, but he's doing something. The book of Hebrews is going to tell us he's interceding for us. He's praying for us. Now, I've got a tremendous assignment and I already feel it, the weight of it. And I came in pretty much frightened as far as my flesh is concerned. But God's going to help me. If he said preach it, then I'm going to study and pray. I've never opened a book up in my life without notes until I did it today. But what what if I tried to preach this introduction? Most of you aren't interested in introductions. It comes out of, uh, most of us are not interested. It comes out of our schooling. The teacher starts an introduction and we go to sleep. Brother, what we want, we want everything without the work. 
We want all the joy and the excitement and the fruit of mathematics without finding anything about the history of it, anything about the background of it. And we don't want it at all. And yet, it's very necessary that we, that we learn something about history. Am I right? I, am I correct about this? I am correct. And so I'm telling you a little bit about the writer. I'm telling you a little bit about his love of Jesus. I'm telling you a little bit about the wonder of the great king of glory. He created the world. And, he, and he's already done something for you and me, the effectiveness of which depends on how you and I respond to him. Because over and over again, he'll exhort us to continue. He said the effectiveness of it depends on our, our continued response to him. He said, don't be weary in your well-doing. That's what he'll say. He said, this is going to bear out. He said, don't get tired of this. Don't give up, he's saying. Because he's speaking to a second generation that's in quite a battle. And I'll tell you a little more about it in, in the days to come. But oh, I'm excited that Jesus, the very God himself, came down to earth and, and came through the power of the blood on Calvary. And he took away something that had never been taken away in all of history. And once he made the sacrifice, that power that declared he was the son of God is available to take away your sins and my sins. Even while we were praying the Lord's Prayer, I felt that someone had asked forgiveness and it got into my heart while we were praying. I said, oh, Jesus, this is wonderful. See, there's nothing like it in all the world. That's why we have the book of Hebrews. He's wanting to tell us how wonderful Jesus is. He's wanting to tell us what he can do for us. He's wanting us to consider him. He wants us to keep looking to him. For he says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. That's what we're going to be doing. I want you to stay with me because, dear ones, how you respond to what Jesus says through me. I'm not sure that I can't say that every word I would say would be the word of Jesus. But when he does... I want you to hear and I want you to appreciate and I want us to gain a vision of Jesus that we've never had before. Apparently we're going to need it because this book was written between two awful persecutions and martyrdom. And while they were in great threatening and while their homes were being raided and goods were being taken. So Jesus is trying to get us ready and let me tell you, he's well nigh able to do for us what no one else can do. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this book of Hebrews. Oh, Lord, when I think of Mark Haney and I think of Dr. Blackwell and I think of the great men of God preaching and the great men like Wesley, my father and others preaching on this great book, it makes me tremble. But Lord, you can say something through me that will be helpful to this congregation. You can do something for me. You've already done something for me. It's forced me to consider what I've never considered before in depth. And I'm praying in the services to follow that you will work through us and speak through us, O Christ of God. We thank thee that Jesus has come to save us from our sins. I thank you, Lord, because I know that every sin we've ever committed is made the universe a little bit worse than it ever was before. And oh, who can avail for us? Well, the answer here is in the book of Hebrews, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came to purge us from our sins. He did, in fact, do it on Calvary, but we have to receive that work by faith before it is made effective in our own lives. I pray that we may begin today, if we haven't already begun, to respond to the work that Jesus did for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.